something that got me interested in music. I think it was at school, um, just the start of um, comprehensive school. A friend, an older friend, got into uh, the Smiths, and um, I remember just getting this. Um, I think it was Hatful of Hollow, and I'm playing How Soon Is Now on the headphones, just getting into that teen sort of angst period. I remember that Johnny Marr's guitar and that probably was a defining moment for me. I'm wondering why this music was having such an effect on me, you know. I think most people, I was born in 71, so there was a couple of beat In my mum's record collection, it was uh, Revolver, The Carpenters, and Bizarre, Pink Floyd, The Final Cut, which I never understood. Why was that one in there? And Black Explosion, which was a soul compilation. So melody and music and stuff are all, were always in the house, but a deeper feeling for music came in my sort of early teens. And when I actually thought, yeah, I'm going to be a musician, was about 15, 16. And it is the cliche, it's the no band yet, can't, can't play chords. And I did, you know, telling the careers advisor that music is my future. You know, well, what's the band called? I don't know. You know, can you play? No. <laughs> have you got any songs? No. Have you got any ideas? No. But that's what I'm going to do. I knew Pete and Cy and Cy Tong from school. We met, we met Nick McCabe at um, college. Um, we were already in a band before we met Nick, but I just heard his guitars were... I heard his actual guitars coming from a room with the door closed. I didn't know what he looked like. And just waited for whoever was making that noise to come out and say, I want to be in a band with you. And then brought in my, my friends and brought in Pete. Pete used to play drums for the school band, kind of, you know, it was one of those. And then we went into an intensive few years of leaving college, going on the dole, and those few years were, they were the thing that really, truly sealed the verves and my whole kind of future, really. To even get a reply from a demo tape, because um, although the Manchester thing had happened, that had been and gone. It's almost like the tumbleweed was blowing back in Manchester again, all the A&R people and everyone had moved out, the thing was dead. So the North again started feeling isolated. So you're sending your tapes off and any, even a positive reply was like a buzz, you know, it felt like you were sending these things off into infinity and the concept of it coming back was just... So the first time we got a positive, it was incredible. And, um, you know, we looked like a mad bunch then and I had a kind of skinhead with a big massive bubble coat on and, God knows what they saw in us, you know. They saw something in us. And subsequently they went on to believe in us for a, for a few years. We, we, got a, we got a chance, not many bands do get a chance. So when you get that chance, when it's there, I think that mad naivety, that mad desire to get away and make it happen pushed us on at the beginning and also created an air of, through what I said, it created an air. It built, we, I built us up. I mean, we did our first concert with a band called the Tansads in Wigan. And the lead singer rang me and said, you're acting like some fascist Svangeli, what are you doing? Because I did this interview in the local paper and said, oh, the town's not big enough, you know, this is when the burp were heard off. And Tansads were like the big band in Wigan. I said, this town's not big enough for the two of us. I said, we're going to blow them off there. And this was like a charity gig at the Wigan Pier. And this guy couldn't believe it. He was like, what are you doing, man? Why are you saying things like that? I said, I'm selling the ticket, man. Don't you understand? I'm getting it, you know. I'm selling the ticket. It's Don, you know, I'm doing my Don King bit. I'm hyping it. And that was part of my personality then. It was all about, we were very, I was, I was like a caveman then. You know, I was land, you know, I literally loincloth, chunk of hash, no shoes, London, oh, I hate you, I hate you, not doing that, not miming in videos, can't do that. You know, we were very, we were difficult people to work with. Our first video, we, we, we couldn't mime. We just couldn't do it. So they had to bring gear in and we played a different song. So on All In The Mind, the first video, you see my mouth singing a completely different song because the concept of even miming was making us feel incredibly uncomfortable. And, you know, almost like we were selling out. First album I wrote, um, See You In The Next One, totally on my own. The rest of the material we often wrote in jams. And I think the reason I went on to write songs is because I was an arranger without knowing it. I was stood with the mic. I was listening to these big swathes of psychedelic guitar music that sometimes we'd go on for 45 minutes in the practice room but that 45 minutes within it there was four or five moments of magic and they needed to be brought down like this is music i came back and heard this is music it was it was like a it was 35 minute piece it was funkadelic jimi hendrix it was incredible piece but 
there was there was a chance there to bring it together and make it into an a, a explosive song. And that's what I started doing. I started helping arrange this music, and then I'd put the melody and the lyric over the top, which, without me knowing it, gave me gave me a bit of knowledge for later on. But yeah, when I first did History and On Your Own on Northern Soul, I played On Your Own 35 times on a little tape recorder to myself back in the room because I couldn't believe how it started. It had a middle and then it ended and it seemed all balanced and clear and crystal. Um, yeah, that was a great moment. What I started doing is writing everything on the dictaphone. And what I did, found was if I, if I put fast forward on the dictaphone after I recorded it and listened to it and garbled sped up time, it became like a condensed Motown song because everything was happening really quickly. So I'd hear the melody and I'd, the stronger it was when it was garbled and fast and contained, you know, it was almost like you could hear a two minute 30 pop record. That's how I started doing it, started doing Sonic like that. Drugs don't work, lucky man. Um, and these all started flowing out at the same time. It was amazing. It was like a, it was like some big doors had been opened and they were just flowing. I just bought a record, bought the record in Manchester and I had a little dance set one day and I was playing it and I just played the intro and I thought, that's it. That little chunk there is going to become something huge. So I tried it with John Leckie when we looped it, and I did the lyric over it. Um, and Urban Hymns went through about three different producers until we got to the final setup. Um, yeah, it was simply dance set, record, dictaphone, singing into the dictaphone, taking that to the studio. Um, but I think the killer moment was when we, me and, and Will came down and we did the strings for it. I knew Biss Sweet, I'd never heard anything like it in my life. So that was, that was always going to be odd because there was nothing like it. I used to drive around before anyone had heard it and play it really loud at the traffic lights with the windows down, trying to see if anyone could hear it and see the reactions, you know. If you'd given that to the 70-year-old Richard Ashcroft, I'm sure he would have thought it was the greatest moment of his life, you know. But um, a lot had changed by then. It's almost, I think, even by the time I got a record contract, I was looking for something different out of, out of the band. Even by the time of 20, 21, 22, my, my idea and concept of what I wanted out of this was, was, was changing. And um, as I started writing songs, the, the buzz was changing. What I, what I was buzzing off was the writing and construction and recording of these songs. So the success was the finish of the record. The success after it was one, you know, it, it, it didn't freak me out at all. It, it, internal pressures within the group that had been there since we started from day one, you know, were making it difficult. The unfortunate thing with this business is, you know, real illness and, and true problems, they become, they become wrapped in cotton wool, so the problems are never really faced because it's very easy to, to it's very easy to get up at eight in the morning, have four bo bottles of Bex, no one's saying if, you know, no one's telling you you're an alcoholic yet because you're in the band, man, you know what I mean? Ah, go on. Someone, you see a character over there. He's doing a big. He's doing a big line at a time. When have you told him seven years ago? You, you know, do you realise at seven in the month, the first thing you'll do? It's just like, how do you get there? How, how do you get to that point? I never wanted Spinal Tap. I never, I never wanted it to get there. So um, yeah, I think the band would have gone anyway. You know? No, I was always in charge of everything. I always had all the responsibility. I always did all the interviews. You know, the day I didn't do an interview in Los Angeles, the rest of them freaked out and got blood and couldn't make the call in the morning. So I had to do it in the night. So it's like I always had that weight. I always took it. So it's actually less now. It's less of a struggle now because the weight of responsibility is, is purely for me, being in the studio, just the guitar, my wife and Chris Potter and nobody else. <laughs> it's like, right, where do we go from here, you know? And that was alone with everybody. And um, it was an education again to, to because I've been in such a closeted environment, you know, I had to start looking around now and try and find some people who were going to help me on the trip. You know? um, and I think it was an achievement, that first record, from starting from scratch. And um, it gave me that springboard for this human conditions. Um, and subsequently other people have come on the trip as well. And at first I wasn't, it was like, come on, you know, do me a favour, go on. I'm sure there's a dozen other albums released this month that deserve um, that kind of visceral vitriolic kind of, uh, but I think there's a sense of not wanting me to get away with it, you know, almost like everyone wanted to believe that the verb was this 
magical thing with all the components together and take the three components out and the guy's not going to be able to make it. I think it's, it's, it's gone beyond what I did in The Verb. I think there's some songs on this record that, whether it's the fact that it's, there's a part of my, pers my brain now that can be concentrating on the music that isn't dealing with the stuff that inevitably comes with being in a band, whether that's just giving that extra percent, I don't know, but there's some tracks on the album I feel that could stand next to any song I wrote in The Verb or anything The Verb ever did. I think sometimes you're just talking to yourself and don't really realise it, and maybe in a year's time you realise it. You think, oh Christ, that's what that was about. Sometimes it may not even have anything to do with me, I don't know. You know, some, I don't overanalyse it, but that's the beauty of some of the songs I've written so far. I'm starting to think, Christ, these songs are, um, they, these are going down, these are classics, man. You play Lucky Man and the Drugs Don't Work last night, it's, it's just incredible, it's incredible. So hopefully, when this one comes out, it's not going to be such a frenzy when I play those, and you know, it's that same old thing. But you, that's inevitable, you know. It's inevitable that some songs are going to are going to connect on a, on a on a deeper level than others. Brian Wilson, that's an astonishing turn of events for for someone like me. It's to happen to a kid from Wigan, Brian Wilson's on my song, you know. If you could have told those guys we were talking about when we were 15, 16, 17 in those lounges that one day this guy who was blowing our minds on Pet Sounds was going to be on one of my records. So that started with simply my eyes closed in the studio listening to the song, um, listening to my deep voice. I thought of Dennis Wilson at first, Specific Ocean Blue, the album he made, which is an amazing record, and some of the sounds on Nature is the Law reminded me of it. And then Brian Wilson, and then the Wilsons, the story, the sound, and this all happened quite quick. And I came out of this and said to a few people around, oh, the great Brian Wilson can sing on Nature is the Law, and everyone's like, yeah, yeah great, yeah. as if. And a few days later, I um, went to an interview with Mojo, and, and Brian was one of my heroes, and someone knew his manager there. Uh, subsequently, a phone call was made because I told him about my idea, and he wants to hear Nature is the Law. So he gets the song and a, a little bit of information about me and, and says, yeah, he's got, he wants to do it. So he books himself into a studio in Los Angeles and goes there after the tour, and he did it in LA when I was in London. And I was frantically writing the lyrics there and faxing him to Los Angeles, hoping, you know, I, I was convinced somebody was going to put a spanner in the works at some point. Something was going to go wrong. There would be a power cut just as he sat down at the piano. But he got the lyrics, he did it, and he sent it back. And it was one of the greatest moments of my life. Hopefully, be a bit more consistent with the release of the records. Um, try and get a grip of this touring recording business. Try and, um, try and not wave goodbye to the studio now for a year and a half and, you know, who knows, man, it's just gonna be exciting. That Again, I've got a, another blank canvas to work on now. This one's finished. Everyone's expecting me to die out like some classic lead singer of a successful rock band or perhaps cry for a reunion in five years' time. You know, but it's just not going to happen. And I love having an opportunity to rewrite, rewrite the blueprint. Same with the verb, we, we rewrote the concept of what you need to do or, or need to play to be successful. And I'm going to do it again as a solo artist. I'm going to rewrite, you know, Roger Daltrey leaves The Who, does a solo, I'm not successful. The Who, Who, back together. Mick Jagger does a solo, I'm not, you know, this ain't going to happen here. I'm going to make, I'm going to try my artist over the next few years to, to balance it to the point where, you know, it's actually swinging in, it's swinging in my favour. That might take a few records, I don't know. But I've said it before, it's my opportunity not to be a ghost. Because essentially when you have such a big effect on people at a specific time, when a video is shown so many times, you do become, unless you balance it out with something bigger or you come out and connect with people again, you are going to be there for the rest of your life. You're going to be, I'm going to be locked in 97 walking down the street the bloke from The Verve. I'm going to get a t-shirt with the guy from The Verve. You know, it's a great name. My mum should have thought of it.